Hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me. I had a really sort of weird way of getting into this. You know, I, um, I started my career uh, in, in, in this sort of engineering bubble, right? You can imagine that when you start your career in engineering, you know, it, it, it starts the story at boring. Could you imagine, like, you're like, God, this is not going to go well. This is not going to be a great talk. <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those things where, where you look around you and there's a lot of things that happen that you're just not sure how they happened, right? How did you get clean drinking water this morning, right? How did the lights go on? Where did that electricity come from? Like, how did the roads that got built, like, you know, come here? And the reason it mattered to me was I was somebody who was born in India. So I, I, I was born in India, and the town that I was from didn't have infrastructure. So you could imagine, I remember when we used to go from uh, town to town in India, the average like speed was maybe 10 miles per hour. And then you come to the US where my dad um, uh, as a physician and so he was able to come to the US, you're going at 80 miles an hour. So you're like, wait a second, what's the difference between going 10 miles an hour and 80 miles an hour? What's the difference between having light and not having light, right? What's the difference between having clean drinking water and not having clean drinking water? And the answer is infrastructure. It's one of those weird words, right? We all love infrastructure. Why? I don't know. Like, you know, there's tax credits for infrastructure. There's financing for infrastructure. But the thing that's happened with infrastructure is that it's all, it's all invisible to us, right? How does your airport work? There's an airport authority that takes care of that. How does your wastewater work? There's wa a wastewater treatment authority that does that. How does your electricity work? There's a utility company that does that. So when you're faced with adversity, you don't actually even know how it happened, right? So for instance, if you lose power in your house and you think, oh, we should get a diesel engine, right? We should get a backup generator. How does that even work? Who do you call to get a backup generator? Where would you put it? Right? Do you have to store fuel on site? Does it need maintenance? How do I even connect it? Is there a physical switch? Right? These are all questions that we're not, we're not like sort of meant to know the answers to. These are not the things that people, people educate us in school about, right? People say, well, your power comes from coal or your power comes from wind or your power comes from solar. But they don't actually tell you how it all works. So that when something goes wrong, like the good people of Flint, Michigan, who had problems with their water, they don't actually know how to fix it, right? And so, so my own story is that I, um, I was actually conceived in Chicago, and my mother said, well, I'm not going to have a baby here. So she went back to India to have me. And so I grew up there for a year, came back to the U.S., and then she had my brother, so she was like, I'm going back to India again. So I was there for a while, <laughs> came back. And then we moved to this rural town in Illinois named Sterling, Illinois. And I remember, um, I don't know how many of you guys remember this time, but back in the 80s, there were all these people from the Southwestern Company that would come to your door. I don't know if you guys know this, but like they'd sell you the Encyclopedia Britannica, and they'd sell you his books. And like my dad was a sucker. <laughs> he would always buy the books. Right? And when you're a kid in the house, you're like, well, I guess I have to read the books because my dad bought the books. And so one day I was just like, you know, I'm not going to read the books because, because that's enough. Enough is enough. I want to go outside and play. I did all this stuff. And I remember being in high school going, here are the books my dad bought after I stopped reading them. I probably should read a few of them. Right? And one of the books was on how we get our electricity. And I remember it was a tiny book. It was like literally, you know, a children's book. And every single two-page spread had a different technology. So this was like the coal spread, flip the page, the nuclear spread, flip the page, the solar spread. And what I found out was like, here's how all these technologies work. And I remember thinking as a 16-year-old kid, all of these technologies are equivalent, right? Because the book had two pages in every single technology, right? So I never knew that we got all of our power from coal. So then, you know, I remember going to my uncle and saying, hey, I think I want to work in solar power. It looks really cool. And my uncle was like, 
You're way too smart to waste your life on solar. And I was like, okay, I guess so. And, you know, I still went to college and I got my engineering degree and I went out in the world. I really like had this nagging suspicion that I really wanted to work in solar. So I got a job in solar. I was working for BP, the big oil company, and they had a solar division. And I remember asking people, you know, wh why don't people buy more solar? It's just so cool, right? And I remember like there was a rancher on the phone and he was like, well, you know, I need to electrify my fence. The utility is going to cost $100,000 to connect it. So I want to buy your solar panels. And I remember we were right there. We were going to close the sale. And he said, my tractor broke down. I can't, I can't get this today, right? And, and it was at that moment you realize it's because when your utility company signs you up, you don't have to pay for the coal plant that supplies you power. You just pay the 100 bucks a month, right? That's all you do. So that's what you want, that's how you want solar. So that's how we came up with solar as a service. So what we do is we got Walmart, Costco, Macy's, Whole Foods, Target to just put solar on the roof. They pay X dollars a month for the power and they pay the same price or less than what they're currently paying and it took off, it took off. And we had Goldman Sachs come in and Goldman Sachs came in and said, here's the, you know, here's a fund, we'd like to finance it. All of this stuff started happening fast and furious. This is 2007, right? And it was so much fun. We, we, were, we were hiring people, we were building more stuff, and not once did ever, anyone ever ask me what the carbon footprint was, so, of solar was. People were buying it because it was cool. People weren't buying it because it was environmental. People weren't buying it because it was a tender sunflower that was waving in the wind. We were like American, we were can do, yes ma'am. Right? We were building steel on people's roofs and people loved it. Right? And so we kept going and the states kept saying, well, this is great. We'll mandate it. We should absolutely have a renewable portfolio standard that mandates that the utilities let you do this. We're going to force them to give you permission. And then Elon Musk comes along and he starts Solar City, and he says, yeah, let's do this for residential customers, right? And then my cousin in India says, hey, Jigger, you should come over. And, you know, he took me to go see the chief minister at the time, who was Narendra Modi, and who was the chief minister of Gujarat, which is the state that I'm from. And he said, this is a great idea. We should do solar here. And, you know, it all started clicking and coming together today. Narendra Modi is the prime minister of India. India is now this approaching the second largest market in the world for solar. And part of what I wanted to help you with is to try to understand how this stuff happens, right? Because the thing is, is that there is so much technology. I did not invent anything in the solar industry. I just learned how to get it into your hands, right? And today, we are in a situation where we have so much technology, we have so much innovation that's available to us, whether it's electric cars or the ability to actually control your thermostat from your phone, right, with the Nest thermostats, or the ability to have backup power with a battery, right, or the ability to have clean drinking water. Today, there's a unit that's the size of me, which was a little smaller a few years ago, but still the size of me, that, that actually can take solar power from the sun and just creates a tap here that provides drinking water to you. You can drop ship it in any place in the world and it provides drinking water at a cost that's less than what you get it for today from your water utility company, right? All of this infrastructure is available, but the key to it is to realize that people don't really want to have to think about it too much. Right? People don't want to have to believe that they have to do this work. But the reason why it's taking off is because everything else is expensive. Right? When you think about your own household budget from 10 years ago, think about where it is. You're paying two to three times more today for your cable bill than you did 10 years ago. Right? You're paying two to three times more for your phone bill than you did 10 years ago. Right? You're paying two to three times more for everything than you did 10 years ago because it's just getting expensive. Most of the infrastructure in this country was built in the 1960s. It's all getting old. Replacing it with new stuff is just really hard. And so, you know, after I sold Sun Edison, Richard Branson asked me to 
to run the carbon war room and said, look, this global climate change stuff isn't working, right? It isn't working because we're not connecting. And how do we connect? Well, we connect to change makers, right? We connect to people who desperately want to get their product out in the marketplace. But what we found was, was that people didn't really believe in their ability to succeed. So what you ended up with was a whole bunch of solutions with nobody buying the problem. When we went into the Copenhagen negotiations in 2009, the message was shared sacrifice. Just pay an extra Starbucks coffee worth of money every month and we'll save the planet. What we did was by the time we got to the Paris Accords, we said, no, this is the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet. And it is. I mean, how many of you know that the number one industry that hired people in this country post the financial crisis is the solar industry? Nobody? Great, a few folks. And so one out of every 50 people, right? 2% of all the people who got jobs since the financial crisis in the solar industry. Wind, right before that, right after that. LED lighting, electric vehicles. This is the reason you should care is because this is the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet. And the reason it is is because all of our infrastructure is old and it needs to be replaced, right? And so going to the 2015 Paris Agreement, everybody was on board. India, Brazil, China. Why? Because they believe that going to some dictator in the middle of some place to get their oil, their coal, their natural gas from is way harder than just impl implementing these solutions in their own hometown. So what we were able to do was database 10,000 change makers from around the world. We were able to equip them with all of these facts and figures. Here's how Goldman Sachs likes to see things. Here are the legal documents you want to use. These are all very simple things, but very complicated and things that people don't actually want to think about, right? So if you're a guy who's invented some new way of producing drinking water, you don't want to become an expert in how to work with Goldman Sachs. You definitely don't want to be an expert in how to deal with your local legal you know, law firm. And so we were able to democratize all these tools. And today, many of those companies are scaling, right? Today, you actually can get cogeneration for your home. You can get battery storage for your home. You can get a lot of these, these technologies that were all available, but they just weren't you know, there. It's one of those weird things where, where for a long time, I think people just didn't think it was possible. I remember Bill Gates saying on stage that the reason this stuff isn't scaling is because, because it's not good enough. No, the reason it's not scaling is because the tools aren't in place to scale it. And so what we do today at Generate Capital is provide people the financing the same way that Goldman Sachs provided it t to me. <coughs> to me for thousands of entrepreneurs around the country and soon thousands of entrepreneurs around the world. You know, recently I went back for a family reunion. You can imagine, you know, you do these things every once in a while. And uh, my uncle was there. And uh, he said, you know, Jigger, I just wanted to say, um, you know, I think I gave you some bad advice back then. I think this thing actually <laughs> like could work. You really should stick with that solar stuff. and." You know, and it's, and it's at the time, it, you know, you, everyone has a chuckle about it, but I think that the part that, that matters to me is that, you know, for me, like, this is an entrenched industry, right? It's one thing when you set up computers, you set up the internet, you set up Facebook, you do all these things, because there's no competition, right? This is something new, right? It's not like computers actually put out of business pen and paper. It was something that was brand new, right? And so for me, we're not doing something that's brand new. Like every day that I succeed, someone else is failing, right? Every time that I put up more solar, you know, last year, 50% of everything installed in the world, in the world, right, was uh, solar. Right? Not coal, not natural gas, not nuclear, not even wind. 50% of everything new that we installed in the electricity sector last year was solar. And so this is not small ball anymore. And what you find is, is that it's very, it's, it's not something that you would think that someone that, you know, was born in India, grew up in a small rural town in Sterling, Illinois, went to the University of Illinois, like was actually it's going to be something that you were able to accomplish. And so part of what I want to let you guys know is that there are people in your community today that are making this difference, right? Whether it's in, in transportation, electricity, water, agriculture, all of these areas. And 
what the most, the best thing that you can do is to encourage them to succeed. I know that I will. Thank you very much.